Hello, and welcome to Geography According to ChatGPT. I'm Kitty Courier, a postdoc in geography at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And to set the stage for today's event, I'd like to introduce Kristoff Janowitz, Professor of Geoinformatics in the Department of Geography and Regional Research at the University of Vienna, and in the Department of Geography at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So Jano, the stage is yours. Well, welcome and glad that you are joining our Geography According to ChatGTP session. We already have roughly 500 people with us here and that's only going to grow within the next three hours. So please also use the chance to connect using the chat, direct messages and so on and so forth. So first of all, let me briefly introduce the team. You already heard from, from Kitty. Kitty is also going to be the wizard in the background, running the entire air meet system, bringing people on stage, backstage, coordinating, and so on. If you experience any technical issues, then please reach out to her. Same goes for Tselong and Mylin, two of our PhD students who are also in the background, working on the entire technical setup, making sure everything goes according to plan. And then, of course, we have us as organizers, Lauren, Jeremy, Geng Cheng, Rene, and, um, well, Christoph and myself. We are coming from different universities in different countries and also industry players to bring you, hopefully, an interesting and diverse program. So what is the program going to be for today? Right now, you are in the intro session, and this is going to take you roughly, let's say, 15 minutes to walk you through some of the motivations and reasons why we are here. And then Geng Cheng Mai is going to take you through a tour of the force through what are foundational models and what geofoundational models could be to level the playing field, so to speak. Then we're going to hear from you. We are very excited that we have some interesting lightning talks that present applications of foundation models, not only ChatGTP, not only stable diffusion, but many more. Then we're going to have two panels, one about how does geography look according to such foundation models and one about the consequences for society at large. And then we're going to have roughly five minutes, maybe a little bit more, for the closing session, where we would like to discuss with you where to go from here, and we have some, some thoughts on that. So why are we here uh, today in the first place? Well, we as organizers believe that it's very important to explore how these foundation models, whether it's ChatGTP, Stable Diffusion, DALI, and many more, describe and depict geographic space, how they categorize geographic features, be them cities, mountains, and so on, how they perform spatial reasoning and where they fail, and how they apply principles of spatial data analysis and to which extent can they already do this. And we would also like to share both perspectives, our excitement and optimism about these current developments, but also the warning voices. And you will see in each session, for instance, the panels, people who represent both perspectives. We would also like to give you a glimpse about how the geofoundational models of the near future are going to look like, and then try to converge on a joint agenda for how to create an ethical geo-AI. We believe that it's important to understand both perspectives, how we think about AI, and as you can see here, this is a depiction from Wikipedia, we, when we think about AI, we tend to think about robots, which is deeply inaccurate, as we know by now. And also, we assign certain characteristics to them, like a thinking face, and they, all, they also look quite white, if you ask me. Right? But it's also important to understand how does AI think about us. And luckily, right now, AI isn't thinking of us at all because it's not thinking. But we can still ask how... Does AI represent us? And here, this is an image generated by Stable Diffusion. The analogy of maybe two tribes lost in the forest isn't maybe all that much off. So let's talk for a second about how we learn about the world through information channels. What makes foundational models really a change in paradigm is the ease with which, with which you can adapt and combine them to serve a wide range of downstream tasks. So almost everybody today, or at least in the near future, can build apps on top of foundational models. 
to make use of AI technologies in whatever they would like to do. So if you think about the different steps this involves with data creation, be it social media or other data sources, here you see multiple types of forests, like the rainforest in the middle, you see forests in the winter, you see forests during fall. Then we have the stages of data creation. When it comes to these foundation models, the training, the adaptation, and finally the deployment, so the end user part. But what we get out is not what we put in. You see all these different forests, forest by day, forest by night, forest in winter, rainforest, and so on. But what we get out, and you will see this as a light motif throughout my entire introduction, is the same kind of foggy, dreamy, fall-like, time-like forest. That's the only forest that stable diffusion is going to generate for you if you don't ask it to do something else. So why is that? This is one of the things we would like to explore today. But let's review a little bit where we are by looking at how it started. So if you look at just 20 years ago, how web search worked, we as users were the one entering keywords. We got rankings from search engines. Of course, those rankings already raised concern to some of us who ranks, why is ranking done in a certain way, which technologies are used, uh, companies that pay for ads ranked higher and so on. But each of the web pages you visited at the end were created by humans, just like us. And most of them, especially before the time of social media, came from a few selected well-known sources. Let's jump ahead just a few years, say 2004, 2005, and you have something like type ahead search or autocomplete. And at first, this may seem like a convenience technology for us, right? Luckily, our search engines now help us to complete the keywords or the sentences that we may want to search. But what this really is and how it was intended from the, from the side of the industry was to make search more canonical because your queries are more canonical, because you're more likely to follow the autocompletion. And why, again, it has been shown that this may generate problems and may trigger systems to display awful text, for instance. Those suggestions still come from prior human users. The next step is then 2012. Of course, there are many steps in between, that's just the ones that we selected here. And then there's the introduction of knowledge graphs into major search engines. And this does something quite interesting. It decouples the results from the documents, from the web pages. So up until 2012, we had a web page, and that had the information that you were looking for, and you had to pass it out, you had to read it, and you were always aware of the entire context, the sentence, the paragraph, the page that this information contains. Now if you ask a major search engine, now if you ask your phone, what is the population of Vienna, for instance, how to get from Santa Barbara to Ventura, you're going to get the answer displayed right on the landing page of the search engine, not the web page. So we moved from a web of document to a web of data, knowledge graphs. But in theory, all this information still comes from humans and sensors that we deployed, and you can track down the sources where it came from, at least if you try. So now since 2018, but most mostly since last year or this year. This has really changed quite fundamentally because now the new interfaces that we are just about to, to start using, the generative AI, provide synthetic results that often don't have any primary source to go back to. So we are able to scale the creation of content that is indistinguishable from humanly created content, at least in the near future at really an arbitrary scale. And what I mean by arbitrary scale here is to make sure that we all understand this is not about creating 100 images, 1,000 images. You can create, even with a small scale setting, millions of images, videos, blog postings every single day, if you like to. So one thing that we would like you to think about is how we thought about what AI will do first, self-driving cars, replacing cab drivers, and what is really happening, namely that the creative domain, the one where we're always told AI is going to leave more room and more space for us to do what we are best at, to be creative. Maybe this part is going to fall first, so to speak, both for the positive 
and the negative. So that makes it also worth thinking about how does it work in reverse? How do we consume information using, for instance, such systems, but also how such systems are going to start shaping how we first perceive the world around us and then actively act in this world. So let's start with a couple of analogies. If you think about 3D printing, then you may say that at least, at least for many of us, this has really been a big step giving the tools of manufacturing, so to speak, to almost everybody. And the same is happening with content creation right now. We are now able, using these foundation models, to scale content creation so that using an API, everybody here in the room can suddenly create wonderful paintings, uh, write essays, and so on. So on the plus side, we are bringing skills like programming, geographic analytics, and so on to the fingerprints of the broad public. They can do this now using these agents, or if they can't do it yet, they will be able to do this probably in a year, two, three, or five. We can also have these systems help us take decisions very rapidly, for instance, during time of crisis, or classify data, pre-select data, again, in, for instance, a crisis and war scenario that we as humans um, wouldn't uh, be or should be shielded away from as long as possible, for instance, about war crimes. They can also contribute to making cities smarter and helping with an intelligent instrumentation. But what we can't forget is that the way humans learn and the ways machine learn is fundamentally different. For instance, learning of machines, machine learning is largely a monotonic process, not the case for the way humans learn. So the important story here that we are trying to bring home in this introduction is that this is not going to be a one-way street. It's going to be a cycle where we are feeding into these foundation models like large language models. But the more we consume the version of reality that they spit out, the more this is going to impact us as individuals, then policy and practice, and then finally our everyday experience. So these systems will also change how we act in the world, again, for good and maybe peace. So to give you a first glimpse, and you will hear more about this later from Gang Chen, about how or what we could contribute as a community. If you look at, for instance, work published by the Google Brain team in uh, 2017, what they did using terms that will be very familiar to you, like the modifiable area unit problem, one of our classics, so to speak, they studied how the images, for instance, in data sets like ImageNet are geographically distributed and discovered that only 1% of all images in those data sets used for training, validation, and testing come from China, and 2 more percent come from India. The rest comes from other places, most notably the United States. So the kind of work that we are familiar with will help de-biasing or raise awareness for problems in these systems. Put differently, spatial distribution does matter. It's also why so interesting to look at some of the work that has been going on in our community of geographic information science, geoinformatics, spatial data science a couple of years ago, where people started to think about geographic information observatories. Are the structures that we created at that time, knowledge graphs today, foundation models, for instance, large language models, so complex that it's worth and so impactful that it's worth studying them in their own rights? similar to people in other domains study, for instance, the physical universe. So GeoAI should also be an empirical inquiry with foundational models as its domain of study. Because as we motivated before, we need to understand how the world looks according to these systems, be them ChatGTP, Stable Diffusion, DALI, and so on and so on, to better understand their huge benefits, but also the potential harm they could cause. Using this idea of geographic information observatories, we can also try to get a first glimpse at how communication with an artificial general intelligence may look like in the future. How distant is the future? Well, that's the interesting thing. We don't know. If you ask people, you will hear just one hardware gap away. Others say we haven't done any progress on more general forms of intelligence. And others say it's one leap, one breakthrough away, so you will hear everything from five years to 500. But if it's five, then we better develop the first glimpse 
at how such communication may play out. Using the Geographic Information Observatory's approach also seems more promising to us than analogies that have been used before, like the stochastic parrot, which is not only misleading in terms of how these technologies function, but also dangerous in so far that it implies that because those are parrots, we have nothing new to learn from them because they are, well, just parroting us. To use another analogy, if those are distorted mirrors, so to speak, then suddenly we can say, if these things really reflect parts of society, we can now run experiments, we can run simulations, for instance, in the social sciences and geography, at a scale and reduced cost that was absolutely unthinkable just a couple of years before. And we can ask two types of questions. What are the inherent problems of these systems, for instance, bias? But also, why are they biased? Because society is also biased, right? So to give you one example of this back and forth, let's consider topology. Topology has been a struggle for many of these systems for many years, and we have documented this at several stages. For instance, during Q&A systems, and now for large language models. For instance, you can ask, Google, same of course for Microsoft, about the distance between Russia and Ukraine. And you're getting something back that to you as human immediately sounds, um, well, almost nonsensical, namely that the distance between Russia and Ukraine is four and a half thousand kilometers. Well, why are they in conflict now, right? Obviously, what's missing here is the information that they have borders that touch, so the distance is zero. Jumping ahead um, 10 years or so, we asked the same question to Check GDP and friends, and we are getting a way more sophisticated answer, but still the very same. Here we are being told that at the closest point, Russia and Ukraine at the border is only five miles apart, right? So the very same problem. And now we can go on, and we have many more examples of failures in topological reasoning and, and spatial reasoning in general, for many of these systems, also the visual ones. So we can ask ourselves, this is maybe one way to motivate why we need spatially explicit models in AI or GeoAI, that's one interpretation. But there's a second equally interesting interpretation, namely that this reflects back on us, that we in the geographic information, geographic information systems, geographic information analysis community still have moved on from geometry first approaches, from absolute reference frames instead of more place-based systems and from overly heavily relying on point-based features. So there are two interpretations, two ways to think about this. Finally, there's another interpretation of what foundational principles could mean. We could also ask ourselves, what are the foundational principles of our discipline, for instance, GeoAI, reflecting on these ethical implications will assist us to conduct the potentially disruptive research of the next years more responsible, identify potential pitfalls in designing, training, and most importantly, deploying these systems rapidly at scale, but also developing a shared understanding of where we are going, again, both for the positive, and there's a lot of it, and the potential risks, but also sharing what we know about the role of spatial thinking and spatial technologies with many other communities. To do this, we need to first understand questions like whether geofoundational models will be neutral or whether they will encode certain biases and why. Given that these geofoundational models will need more retraining than other models, how we can make this sustainable, how we can create a green geo AI instead of competing on the red AI basis, and how to keep an adequate representation and regional variability alive in those models. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for listening to our intro session. I'm going to hand over now to Gang Cheng Mai, who is going to give you a tour de force through what foundation models are more technically and what geofoundational models could be and where we are right now in terms of these technologies. Gang Cheng, take it over from here. Hi. Sure. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome to the Geography According to ChatGPT online webinar. So um, I'm Gong Chen, a country assistant professor at University of Georgia uh, Geography Department as well as School of Computing. So um, 
Yano gave a very good introduction about uh, what is the foundation model and uh, how it will impact the uh, GOA society and versus the geography at large. So to get the ball rolling, I will first give a brief introduction of foundation models, uh, which is the general idea behind ChatGPTs. And I will briefly go through some existing foundation models and discuss how they can be used in geography applications. So um, recent trend in machine learning and AI speak to the power of scale and generalizability. So traditionally, AI models are targeted at specific tasks. For example, we have question answering model, we have machine translation model, image classification model, and image editing model. And instead of doing that, many recent work prefer to do, develop a task agnostic pre-trained model, which can be later adapted via fine tuning, few shot learning, zero shot learning, on a wide range of domains. So we call this kind of pre-trained model as foundation models. Some great example is uh, ChatGPT, GPT-3, and Dell E2. So for example, for GPT-3, after training on internet scale of task, it will launch in 2021 and March and show the state of art performance on many natural language processing tasks via few shot learning. Well, for Dell E2, that was a diffusion-based image generating model launched by OpenAI in 2022. It will also show impressive performance on various computer vision tasks via uh, zero shot learning. So because um, our talk title is uh, ChatGPT, so let me first uh, uh, discuss uh, the story of ChatGPT and uh, how this large language model has been developed and uh, uh, how they are different from each other. So the story of ChatGPT can be traced back to 2017 when a group of Google AI researchers proposed the idea of transformers. So the idea of transformer is to use self-attention to completely replace the recurrent neural network to process sequential data. So the idea is so cool, and it has been revolutionary impact on the whole natural language processing domain. After 2017, most of the large language models are based on transformers, such as BERT, GPT-2, T5, GPT-3, InstructGPT, ChatGPT, and so on and so forth. So this figure I just modified from the figure from the hacking phase, basically illustrates the de uh, development of different large language models. So the x-axis indicates uh, the time when this model is developed, and the y-axis indicates the model size. So here you will notice uh, GPT-3, Instruct GPT, and ChatGPT are three most well-known large language models developed by OpenAI, which they share very similar neural network architecture because have the same model size. But the only difference is how to train them. So the GPT-3 is trained uh, in an unsupervised manner, where Instruct GPT uh, developed in 2022 is uh, adding additional supervised learning uh, training procedure. And they also use a called reinforced learning from human feedback. So the chat GPT is also based on uh, instructed GPT. So all these kind of large language model, most of them are only based on users' uh, instruction, uh, written in text, and then generate text as a response. Basically, they can only read text and generate text. But uh, last month, OpenAI launched GPT-4, which can additionally take images as input. So basically, GPT-4, other than uh, different from the existing large language model, it can do visual question answering. So, so um, other than large language models, we also see foundation model from other domain. So now we discuss natural language processing, we discuss chat GPT and GPT-4. I also mentioned like, uh, in the open source community, there is also some large language model you can use, such as Stanford Abaca. In computer vision domains, um, one important type of foundation models are diffusion-based model, uh, which can generate images based on users' uh, prompts, sketch, or mask. So good examples is Google's image game, or stable stability AI's stable diffusion, and OpenAI's Dell E2. So last month, uh, Meta released its newest segmentation foundation model called Segment Anything model which can handle different image segmentation tasks, such as object segmentation, semantic segmentation, and so on and so forth. In reinforcement learning domain, a good example is uh, DeepMind's Ghetto, which can um, use one model can play video games, capture images, chat, and stack blocks, and so on and so forth. In the signal processing, OpenAI, they combine their Vespers and ChatGPT to provide various cutting-edge language and speech-to-text service. So in this big data era, 
AI and machine learning can become、uh, one of the revolutionary technology for many different domains. So, given all those successful stories as a geographer and a geoscientist,、um, one question I'm particularly interested in, or I hope many geoAI researcher and geographer are interested in, is how this、uh, existing cutting edge foundation model performed、uh, when compared with the state of art fully supervised、uh, task specific model. On different geospatial tasks, so because geospatial is,、uh, geography is very broad, we have、uh, geospatial semantics, urban geography, health geography, remote sensing. We we have、uh, a lot of different subdomains. So in order to、uh, evaluate it, we test several tasks from four different domains, and I will discuss each of them in the following. So first, on the geospatial semantic domain. We first do some、uh, task to evaluate the performance of ChatGPT as well as other large language models on some、uh, on some well established geospatial semantic task. For example, toponym recognitions and location description recognition. So, as a prompt on the left, we just provide the ChatGPT eight few short samples to show how to do toponym recognitions, and then we give it a new paragraph and let ChatGPT let ChatGPT to generate new text. Which is treated as a recognized toponyms. So the similar practice is used for the location description recognition, on the which show on the right. But the difference is instead of recognizing some large scale place names, we ask ChatGPT to recognize some fine grained address. For example, intersection of、uh, two highways or、uh, the address of a home. So we experiment on three well known dataset, and uh, uh, other than ChatGPT, we also try other. Large language models such as Instruct GPT, GPT three, and GPT two with different parameter sets. We also compare them、uh, with fifteen baselines, including the state of art fully supervised task specific models. We can see from the top down recognitions,、um, foundation models such as、uh, GPT two, GPT three, and Instruct GPT, they can consistently outperform the fully supervised baselines. But they only use eight few short samples, and they didn't do any fine tuning. On location description recognition, GPT three also achieved the best recall scores across all methods. But it doesn't show that、uh, the GPT three、uh, achieved the best across all metrics. So in health geography, we also test another、uh, task, which is、uh, let ChatGPT do time series forecasting given the historical U.S. county level dementia record. So basically, we tell them how the、uh, dementia record for a specific U.S. county in the history, and we let them to forecast what will be the dementia numbers for twenty twenty twenty. The result shows that the GPT three and Instruct GPT can even outperform the fully supervised Arima model, even they did not trained on any dementia time series data. So this figure actually、uh, shows a prediction error of different model at different U.S. county level. So here the red color indicate overestimation and blue color indicate underestimation. You can see that all the GPT two models with different size significantly underestimate the dementia values, where the Instruct GPT and GPT three is able to produce a reasonable predictions. However, they still have a、uh, A geographic bias across different counties.、Um, in urban geography domain, we test whether the vision foundation models such as、uh, CLIP, BLEEP, and Open Flamingos can pre-、uh, predict the noisy intensity level of a neighborhood given a street view images. So here we show four example、uh, street view images. So this table summarizes the result. We can see that compared with all fully supervised model, BLEEP can achieve reasonable accuracy. Without any training data, however, still underperform the fully supervised CN models. Similarly, we also do an ex- experiment on remote sensing domain. We test whether this visual foundation model can do、uh, remote sensing image sync classification without any training data, so called zero shot learning. So the results show that、um, although foundation model can have a, a good accuracy, it still underperform the fully supervised CN model. So this also indicates、uh, the difficult the difficulty of remote sensing task, and uh, uh, this gap also indicates there is、uh, some interesting thing we can do. 
So except all these encouraging experiment results, we also find some problems in the current foundation model. So for example, if you ask ChatGPT to or GPT three to predict the geographic coordinate of the recognized autonomous, which is a typical task in geospatial semantic called uh, geoparsing. So the predict coordinate are uh, usually one hundred miles away from hundreds of miles away from the ground truth. So here we show two results from GPT three. The starting point are the ground truths, where the drop pins are the predicted locations. The reason why GPT three cannot perform geoparsing, is, we believe, is it, uh, this large language model by design is unable to handle other data mobility, such as the geographic coordinate or even geospatial vector data. And it cannot perform implicit spatial reasoning in a way that is grounded in the real world. So other than that, another interesting finding is, uh, just like Yano said, um, because of the data is uh, biased across ge different geographic uh, different countries, the different regions. So the foundation model trained, pre-trained on this data is also show some geographic bias. If you ask ChatGPT, uh, is Washington uh, located in North Carolina? The ChatGPT will tell you there's, uh, will tell you no, because it interpret Washington as Washington state. Um, but actually according to Wikipedia, or if you search on Google maps, there is a Washington in North Carolina. Um, we hypothesize that is because there are much more data about Washington State compared with Washington in Carolina, North Carolina. So that's lead to a geographic bias on the model. Similarly, there's also temporal bias on the model. If you ask GPT-4, where was Newport in Indiana before 1878? Notice there is a temporal scope. So the GPT-4 will return a place name Newport right now. Interestingly, before 1978, uh, Newport was a name for another city we are currently known as Fonti uh, Fountain City. So this, this indicates that uh, GPT-4 does not understand this temporal scope thing, and it has also have temporal, or it have temporal bias towards the current data rather than the historical data. So uh, finally, we, um, in terms of uh, thinking about how to use foundation model uh, for GeoAI, we actually pr propose a vision for a foundation model for various GeoAI tasks. The one major challenge for GeoAI task is it has many data modalities. We have uh, text data, we have remote sensing images, we have uh, vector data, geospatial knowledge graphs, and trivial images. So given all these different diverse data modalities, we need to develop a multi-modal multi foundation model for GeoAI that uses geospatial relations as alignment among different data modalities. So the key advantages of such model is to enable spatial reasoning and knowledge transfer across different data modality. Um, last, um, thank you for listening. And uh, currently, we actually are organizing a IGGS special issue on geospatial foundation models. So the abstract deadline is September 23. If you are interested in this direction, you are welcome to submit your abstract to us. Thank you.